All right, thanks everybody. I am going to begin. If you could all uh, take your seats, please. Uh, so our next discussion is going to be a, a case presentation on uh, one of the newer defined aspects uh, of regenerative medicine. I'm Keith Murphy, uh, Chairman and CEO of Organ Novo, based here in San Diego. Um, and we're going to do uh, a little case study on cell and tissue models in drug discovery and, and development. So the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine has a, uh, has a big tent um, uh, intent in terms of defining regenerative medicine, bringing in more groups, more patient advocacy groups, more companies, um, and more research institutions. So we want to have a big tent mentality to make sure we define regenerative medicine broadly. So we undertook this year to actually... Um, to uh, do a definition of uh, regenerative medicine and revisit that. I won't represent all the aspects of that, but one of the things that was focused on was the concept of using uh, cells and tissue models in uh, disease modeling for drug development and research. So we wanted to provide a little bit of a panel and, and case study today on how that looks in application. Um, some considerations in how this process works. This is pretty basic information about, you know, how we actually move things forward. When you're actually doing this, of course, you're talking about new molecular entities that you're discovering typically. These models can, however, often be used for cell-based uh, therapy as well. If you're thinking about a tissue model, you certainly can test a cell-based therapy in that and move that forward. But typically, you have a number of steps in that process. So the first is going to be innovation. Uh, obviously, at a research institute or at a small company, typically you're, you're seeing the creation of a technology, a regenerative medicine technology in a way that can move forward and impact the discovery process and the development process. So you're thinking about here um, the use of stem cells, of course, and I'm going to actually speak a little bit about 3D bioprinting, new technologies that are, enabled, are able to help the process out. At that point, you need to think about where those are applied. And that can be very broad, but most typically, obviously, at the, at the R&D stage in small companies, uh, at the research stage in, in, uh, in a research institute, um, or in larger pharma companies as well, often in partnerships. So this is a partnering meeting. We want to talk about the aspects of, of how we bring the people together to achieve these ends. So once you have the innovative technology, you can think about those ways to, to partner and actually um, take advantage of those in the application. And then at the commercialization stage, and more typically, especially if you're talking about a new molecular entity, there you're thinking about partnering with pharma, moving that forward. I think in rarer cases, you're going to see um, regenerative medicine companies taking their own um, uh, molecular entities forward, but certainly you'll see a number of cell therapies discovered in these, through these types of technologies taken forward. And there I'd be specifically talking about cell therapies that were tested in a, in a disease model research tool. Um, so we have a number of folks here to talk about this process in application, and we're going to walk through two case studies. Uh, the first is going to be actually uh, Cellular Dynamics. So uh, Cellular Dynamics is a, is a well-known company to many of us, but a newly public company from their recent IPO this summer. Uh, and they're developing induced pluripotent stem cell technologies um, through their iCell uh, product line and, and working with companies to use these in the research space for drug discovery and development. Uh, they partner with Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute here in town. Uh, Dr. Ann Bang is actually going to speak to us uh, about her use of that in, in the center, the, the Prebis Center at, uh, at, at Sanford Burnham. Uh, on my side, I'll be talking about Organovo's 3D bioprinting technology. And we have uh, Dr. Joe Carroll here from the Oregon Health and Science University. So Organovo's 3D bioprinting is in use there in cancer research. They're, they're a very well-known center in advanced technologies in cancer research, uh, having been funded uh, by Phil Knight of Nike and recently had an additional challenge grant from him. So we'll hear from Dr. Carroll on, on that technology and the applications there. So with that, uh, I'm actually going to turn it over. I'll tell, uh, those are the two members of our panel from the Research Institute. And then Chris Parker is joining us to talk about and introduce cellular dynamics side of this. Uh, he's the chief commercial officer there. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chris now, I think, to speak about, to speak about CDI. Are there any slides? <laughs> They're going to come up. OK, great. I don't know, should I do it? It's, it's up to you. I'll just do it here. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Parker from Cellular Dynamics uh, International. And uh, I'm going to try to do this as rapidly as possible, because I think the interesting thing uh, that everyone is here to 
uh, hear about is, is Anne's research uh, with the use of these materials, and, and that's kind of a running theme uh, for our company in general. Uh, partnering and, and working with uh, entities that leverage uh, stem cell biology um, is our mission in life. Um, just a, a brief uh, bit about the company. Uh, we're based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, it's really been built around Dr. Jamie Thompson's vision uh, of enabling the access to human biology in an unprecedented form. Um, we currently uh, employ about 125 staff um, that's growing. We actually now have a footprint here in, in California, uh, in Novato, uh, where we'll be adding more people. Um, we have about 550 years of human stem cell biology experience in the company. Many of the individuals in our labs uh, were there when the first embryonic stem cell uh, line was developed in Dr. Thompson's lab, and were also present uh, when the first IPS line was developed as well. Um, we have uh, really three uh, main competencies, all built around manufacturing. It was really interesting in the, in the previous session to talk about that. Um, we've really invested heavily um, in the large-scale manufacturing of, of uh, terminally differentiated cells, uh, primarily from IPS cells, and really invested in the ability to do that in parallel uh, to be able to generate panels of cells. We have uh, 700 patents um, under license or owned by the company. This is really about freedom to operate. Uh, our, our most recent patent that's issued uh, as of uh, about a week ago is uh, covering episomal reprogramming. Uh, this is a broad patent. Um, that was issued by the U.S. Patent Office. Um, but our, our really main function in life is to generate cells, uh, engineer them for research, um, and then be able to manufacture them um, in unprecedented quantities. Um, and really, from a partnering standpoint, it's really critical for us because CDI um, works with a lot of nonprofit organizations in terms of being able to generate tools around their research from an IPS-based uh, perspective. Um, you know, the Cure CMD is an example, the Jane Foundation. We also work with uh, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. We recently received a grant to generate uh, 3,000 uh, IPS lines from uh, uh, 3,000 uh, donors uh, in 11 different diseases. Uh, we partner with uh, biotechs um, and uh, also uh, academia as well as platform providers um, because we want to demonstrate that the cells that we produce can work in as many applications as possible so that we can really address questions around um, moving discoveries uh, for therapies forward. Um, and that really leads us to the discussion with Anne, um, whereby we, we really want to enable um, the standardization and the criteria around uh, analysis as much as possible. Um, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Anne. Give her as much time as possible. I feel like the legislature. <laughs> I defer my minutes. <laughs> Just wait one second. Not able to advance the slides. There we go. There we go. Got it. Good. All right. So I work at the Previs Center. We're a state-of-the-art drug screening facility with bicoastal operations in the San Diego and Orlando, Florida campuses of the Samford Burnham Institute. We have over 70 FTEs on staff, <clears throat> and um, our drug discovery capabilities really range the full gamut from assay development to high throughput screening. Um, to hit to lead optimization. So we're very collaborative. Uh, we have partnerships not only with government agencies, but with industry and private organizations as well. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a very fruitful collaboration between my group at the Previs Center that are focused on stem cell biology and Cellular Dynamics International. Okay. All right, so with the advent of uh, induced pluripotent stem cell technology, there's really been a lot of excitement about bringing these cells into the drug discovery process with the thinking that they would provide more relevant models for studying human disease, for doing large-scale drug screens, and for testing drugs for their efficacy and for their toxicity. There's uh, certainly been a, a tremendous amount of progress in the last few years towards these goals, but I think that the excitement is, is still tempered by the realization of the technical hurdles that we have to overcome before we can fully exploit the potential of these cells. All right, so uh, what are the requirements for bringing IPS-derived differentiated cells, like neurons or cardiomyocytes, into the drug discovery process? 
First of all, you have to have a, a source of cells that are highly enriched and they're characterized. They're available in, in large um, reproducible batches and they can be quality controlled. Um, with this, you'll enable, uh, hopefully in the future, larger scale primary screens and already uh, smaller scale screens and secondary assays. So some of the criteria that really need to be met, these cells have to be amenable to miniaturization. So for instance, they can be um, plated in the 384 well plate, which is one of the workhorses of the drug discovery uh, process. Um, they need to be reproducible, of course, well to well, plate to plate, so you can compare conditions across the board. And as well, you need throughput. You'll need scalability. You'll need a lot of these cells. And uh, uh, best if they're amenable to some sort of level of, of automation. So Cellular Dynamics International has, has really been one of the leaders in the field in industrializing these processes um, and producing IPS differentiated cells that are taking many strides towards uh, meeting all of these criteria. So the next slide uh, describes uh, the collaboration that we did where the concept was to take iCell neurons, IPS derived neurons that CDI produces, plate them in 384 well plates and then screen them against a collection of, of over 5,000 compounds in two concentrations in duplicate for a total of about 26,000 wells. So this is a fairly large scale screen for such a complex cell type. Uh, the um, compounds that we chose to focus on were known bioactives and known drugs where we know something about the target. For instance, we looked at over 1,000 uh, kinase inhibitors. And the readouts of the phenotypes that we were interested in were uh, neurite outgrowth, retraction, and cytotoxicity. So um, the agreement that we came up with was milestone-based, whereby we would receive cells and reagents upon successful completion of each phase of the program. Uh, the project was, was really collaborative in nature. We had monthly joint group meetings between my group at the Previs Center and between CDI. And I think our goals were really mutually beneficial. That was to show feasibility of bringing these cells into drug screening, to develop a technology platform that we at the Previs Center could use in the future for other IPS-based drug screens, and then also to, to pl publish the results. And as well, I think the results uh, really have potentially implications for the field of uh, looking at nerve regeneration uh, and synaptic remodeling, for instance. All right, so uh, the, the first step of the process is really to develop an assay in which you really subject the cells uh, to a certain um, uh, amount of uh, scrutiny. First, we showed that they were viable out of thaw, uh, that they were tolerant to DMSO. They have great well-to-well -well reproducibility. Sorry. So you can, uh, sorry. I'll just continue on. They have great well-to-well -well reproducibility, and they were really amenable uh, um, to uh, automation. They can be handled with automatic liquid handlers. All right, so next we had to show that we could take a, a compound and that the cells would respond in a, in a robust and reproducible way to that compound. For a controlled compound, we chose storosporin, which is known to induce a neurite outgrowth, as you can see in the middle panel there. Uh, to analyze the results, we used algorithms um, by which we could measure many different features of the, of the cells, the number of neurites, the number of branches, the lengths of the neurites, and then that would allow us to uh, quantify our results. Uh, shown here in this dose response, where we could um, look at, for instance, the total neurite length. This allowed us to determine whether or not the assay was sufficiently uh, robust for screening by applying uh, certain statistics. All right. So this last slide um, describes a number of examples of hits we've gotten from the screen. We finished the primary screen of 5,400 compounds. Uh, here you can see a compound that, from the screen that induced neurite outgrowth, one that induced retraction without causing cytotoxicity, um, and one that clearly induces cytotoxicity. We're classifying these hits based on clustering compounds that uh, have similar structures, targets, and pathways. And as well, we're using a com combination of features uh, affected. And this is one of the, the powers of high content or image-based screening. So every cell that was screened um, in the screen, we can measure 11 different features. And then shown in this heat map, you can see how we can then subclassify the response to the compounds uh, into different classes. All right. So in conclusion, uh, I think you know, we 
had very successful collaboration where we were able to leverage each other's capabilities and complete this 26,000 well screen demonstrating the feasibility of higher throughput uh, image-based compound screening using these IPS-derived neurons. It's clear the iCell neurons were robust and reproducible enough uh, source of cells for this screening application. Um, and we are planning to put together a, um, a publication that we think will be the basis of a reference set of modulators of neurite growth and cytotox uh, for this comprehensive collection of known bioactives and drugs. All right, in the last slide, I just want to acknowledge the people who did the work. Sean Sermon, a, a postdoc in my lab, did uh, all the screening and analysis that I just described. Uh, he was supported by many folks in the screening center. Michael Jackson is the vice president of uh, drug discovery at the Sanford Burnham. He's very supportive of his program. And then the group at Cellular Dynamics that we were interacting with, Susan Dolores, uh, iCell Neuron Group, Melanie Pierce, and Vanessa Ott. So I'll stop there. All right, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about Organovo's bioprinting technology, and, and uh, similar to Chris, I want to keep this short and move on to, to Joe Carroll's presentation. So Organovo does 3D bioprinting, which is basically the, um, the creation of th 3D living tissues, functional human tissues outside the body um, in a way that uh, recre recreates tissue sufficiently enough to show biology that's similar to in vivo. So we start with any cell source, and through the bioprinting process, which I unfortunately don't have time to go into any detail on today, uh, we actually create this tissues with relevant architecture, um, putting right the correct cells in the correct positions and using all of the correct cell types in the correct proportions to actually get essentially in a multi-well plate uh, a representative piece of tissue. And in the context of, of drug discovery, that obviously has very interesting applications. Um, you know, we also do work in the broader sense in developing tissues as therapies, so for surgical therapy, um, which is more aligned with the history of regenerative medicine, of course, and tissue engineering. Uh, but this application is, is really grown to be a large part of our business, and we've developed a, a large number of partners around this um, that you can see here that we are working with. Um, one of those is here today, uh, Joe Carroll from the Knight Cancer Institute. Um, and so he's going to talk to us, I think I have one more slide if we could, yeah. So uh, he's going to talk to us about how we interact with them in the cancer setting. Um, but I just want to show a little bit about this, uh, you know, in, in comparison to uh, what Ann was talking about in the um, 384 well plates, you have to think about when you make a larger tissue and you're not working with cells, that you are working with something of substantial size. So the range of multi-well plate that you're thinking about here is actually 24 to 96 wells. Currently, that's sort of the state of the art of the technology. Um, we typically will put those in a trans well, as you can see on the right here in this image, uh, which gives some added functionality to the screening process. Process. When you are working through a screen and you have some hits, you can do a lot more than just automatic plate reading on that sample. You can pick that sample up, start to work with it histologically. You can do any number of things. So that's very powerful uh, for a number of our partners. And of course, this is, can be used throughout the drug discovery process. You see some of the sample tissues there, and I encourage you to go on our website and, and see how we can use or what other aspects of uh, this we work on. Um, but I'll make a final point in saying that, you know, the, the most uh, applicable area that we work in today is going to be in the area of, of lead identification and, uh, and target uh, and lead optimization, really. So hit to lead, uh, lead optimization is the area we can work best given the nature of the number of cells or number of wells we can actually work with in this process. So we're not at the high throughput screening um, standpoint. We're more down to the, you know, choosing the right molecule and getting to the right final molecule to move forward and avoid potentially costly mistakes by being superior to animal models um, and superior to, in some cases, in, in some sp specific disease areas and specific tissues, for example, 3D liver, which we're very focused on, um, being superior to uh, what hepatocytes on a, on a flat surface can essentially do for you in a well setting. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carroll for his uh, talk about uh, cancer. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Are you advancing? Are you... They're going to put them up for you, and then you can advance them. Well, I want to thank Keith and the other organizers for inviting me here, an interloper from the oncology space into regenerative medicine. I appreciate it. And there are some interesting uh, parallels, of course, between cancer and uh, regenerative medicine in the stem cell field, so I will allude to that briefly. I want to just give you a short intro into the Knight Cancer Institute and OHSU. So 
OHSU is in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we're the only medical school in the state, and we even have our own gondola. So this is how I get to work every day. We're, uh, the medical school is up on the hill, and we're building buildings down on the waterfront, but I actually ride that to work, as do about 2,000 people every day up the hill. Cool. So we take cancer very personally at the Knight Cancer Institute. And on the next slide. Right, I'll just tell you that our uh, director is Brian Jerker. He was the co-developer of Gleevec for chronic myeloid leukemia. It was really the first personalized therapy, full stop. And uh, the Knight Cancer Institute was founded in 2008 by a large gift from Phil and Penny Knight, um, at which point Brian became the director of the institute, and we were able to recruit about 200 physicians and scientists into the institute to focus on personalized cancer therapy. We bring in about $120 million a year in research funding, and we conduct about 400 clinical trials a year. Uh, Keith alluded to a recent challenge that we received from our patron, Phil Knight, a billion-dollar cancer challenge. So the, the hitch is, because Phil is a sports guy, that he's incentivizing us with uh, the ability to raise $500 million with a $500 million match. So um, I'll be at the door and accepting checks later today, but actually the challenge is allowing us to bring co-investment into the Knight Cancer Institute to focus on things like the assay platforms that we're working with uh, Organovo on. So I'm going to talk about three basic areas that we're uh, working on in the Knight Cancer Institute. The first is in basic cancer research, where really we're looking at molecularly targeted focus, not disease site. So although you have to work in a given tissue, lung cancer, or pancreatic cancer, we're really thinking about how individual disease targets cut across all of those disease sites these days to come up with personalized cohorts of patient therapies. At the night, we're really clear that we don't develop drugs ourselves. So we partner with other drug companies and pharma. Um, we know that our strength is in assay platforms and clinical access to patients. So by doing that, we're able to have a dedicated phase one unit a dedicated bio library collecting patient samples to evaluate drugs on, and a very entrepreneurial clinical system where the clinicians and researchers are really vested in bringing new therapies to cancer patients. We have um, a number of alliances and partnerships. I'll talk about a, a couple of these today, in particular the Organova one. But in essence, they're focused on three areas. One is big data. So we announced six months ago a large alliance with Intel, our neighbor in uh, Portland. And um, Intel, of course, is interested in anything that is big data. So they're bringing their computational biology expertise to our next-gen sequencing partnerships with Illumina and Life Technologies. Uh, we're also focused in molecular diagnostics. We announced a few months ago a partnership with Cepheid, based in Sunnyvale, looking at a PCR-based platform. And um, we're working with them on oncology assays. And then lastly, 3D, 3D assay platforms of cancer with Organovo. Okay, so these three partnerships that I'm going to talk about today are three areas. The first one is in the 3D modeling of tumors. And this is the one that we're really strongly uh, developing a deepening relationship with Organovo on. Um, we, it really grew out of some work that Joe Gray and Lisa Cousins were doing at the Knight Cancer Institute, uh, looking at sort of layered two-dimensional systems. And I'll tell you the difference between those and our 3D model system as well. We're then bringing those uh, basic cancer research insights into translation of the research and a patient focus. And we recently, a month ago, we were able to secure a $25 million gift from a private foundation to uh, found a center for pancreatic health and pancreatic cancer focus. And again, the Organova platform is a key part of this platform, but it's really going to allow us to think out of the box about how we look at pancreatic cancer. The last one I'm not going to talk about today, but it really is directly focused on uh, transforming our approach to leukemia, uh, looking at a whole genome sequencing approach with Brian Joker um, and a number of different partners to be able to change that paradigm. Okay, so how do we think about cancer in three dimensions? You know, cancer is really an ecosystem of cells working together, and this is a depiction in cartoon form of uh, a bunch of epithelial cells and surrounded by an ecosystem of different stromal and immune cells. Uh, and they're fed by an endothelial cell uh, component, which makes up a vascular system as well as a lymphatic system. 
So we, you know, cancer is complex, and we really want to be able to model this well in three dimensions to come up with better therapies. And I have to say right now in cancer, we're doing a better job. But as you all probably know, we have a long way to go. Uh, we spend about $30 billion a year on cancer therapy in the US. And the drugs only work about 35% of the time. And when they do work, we're often only prolonging life for six months or so. So the field is becoming aware that we're clearly missing something in the cancer space. And we think a lot of it, and it's not just us but others, is really down to understanding better the 3D microenvironment and the heterogeneity of cancers where they sit in three dimensions. So we, we're using two approaches to look at this. The first is sort of a layered two-dimensional microenvironmental uh, array system. And that's depicted on this slide. And this is a platform that was instituted by Joe Gray and people in his lab. So what I'm showing you on the left here is cells grown on microenvironmental proteins. So these are proteins that you find in the stroma of a tumor. And then we just um, have microspotting technology where we're able to put cancer cells on top of these different microenvironmental pro micro proteins. And what you can see is that a standard cancer drug like lapatinib, which is used for ER-positive breast cancer, is really effective on some microenvironments, but not other microenvironments. So on the top, you're seeing uh, the cells dividing, and that's depicted by that pink stain in the nucleus. And that's showing you that lapatinib is actually not working very well, whereas in the bottom, uh, lapatinib is able to work on that conducive microenvironment. So this is a very simple um, depiction that is telling you that the microenvironment is important in cancer therapy. So on the next slide, uh, Keith later uh, alluded a bit to the Novogen uh, printing system from Organovo. Later today, Sharon Presnell will be speaking about this. So if you're interested in detail in the printer, I would recommend you going to her talk. But in essence, what it enables us to do is think about the geometry and the architecture of tumors and then use this really interesting bioprinter that they've created to construct tumors based on building blocks um, of these, of these uh, complex systems. So it's a lot like building a house, where you're able to start with the bricks and the mortar. And the bricks and mortar, in this case, are combinations of different cell types. So the epithelial cells, the immune cells, and the stromal cells. And then you're able to also build in soluble factors and proteins from the microenvironment to make uh, better model systems. So in pancreatic cancer, what we're focused on is this. Pancreatic cancer, as many of you know, is one of those cancers you do not want to get. It's extremely intractable to, to treatment and to therapy. And one of the reasons for this is shown in the cartoon in the upper left. And that is that the epithelial cancer cells are surrounded by a really dense uh, stromal barrier um, that uh, the endothelial cells have a component in, as well as immune cells and stromal cells. So, this is a very complex structure that exists in vivo in the tumor. And we want to try to model this in three dimensions using the bioprinter. So on the bottom, I've shown you that we're going from a 2D complexity, modeling it, modeling it up through a 3D organo organoid-like complexity, and then to a tissue printing complexity, and then eventually to a humanized mouse system. So this is the kind of structure that we're trying to model using the Organova printer. And even though we've only been doing this for six months, we've had a lot of success. So on the left is a section of human breast cancer um, and staining the cancer cells here in green with the cytokeratin gene and then the stromal cells in red and the nuclei in blue and then comparing that to, on the right, a printed breast cancer tissue. So this is using patient cells and we're actually able to reconstruct to some degree the structure that we see in a complex uh, tumor system. So with this, we're able to now approach drug companies. And we've already had a lot of interest uh, from several drug companies about screening their drugs in these fully human-based uh, patient cell-included systems with Organovo. And if I could go to the next slide, which I think is the last slide, where really the future of this is to be able to not just model it better, but to use patient cells uh, from the original tumor site and to treat with a rationally designed therapy that is really reflective of uh, the patient cell microenvironment in vivo, assess the response, and then bring that therapy to that individual patient. OK, and the, the next slide. So with that, I'd like to close. And thank you very much for your attention.
All right, that's, uh, that's our allotted time. Uh, I would like to see if there are any questions from the audience. We could take a, a couple quick questions here, but otherwise we'll move into the break. Yes? So we're just, is my mic again? Yeah, you're good, you're good. We're just focused on oncology platforms, but there, yes, we do start with controlled drugs. And we look at a variety of different uh, stromal and, and microenvironmental uh, platforms to assess the individual response of those drugs. Sure. Yeah, a number of the drugs, especially the ER-positive drugs, do work in, in ER-positive patients for a certain period of time. They don't work in all the patients. They work in some of them. And I think we're getting to the heart of the heterogeneity of tumors. So I think we need to understand the complexity of microenvironments, soluble factors, um, and cell populations that exist in addition to the cancer cells to really come up with the most effective therapies. And I think that's the key to what we're talking about, is if you have a discordance between what you're seeing in the lab and what you're seeing in the clinical re results, how can we close that gap? Can we be more predictive in the lab? Right. Well, uh, at CDI, um, I think one of the things that's advanced our technology the most rapidly with the pharma industry is that um, we've taken a number of drugs that not only have passed um, their in vitro testing, but also passed all their in vivo testing and gotten into clinical trials. And they've been able to... <clears throat> take those drugs back and test them on our cells, and they would have been able to predict the toxicity that they saw um, in the clinical trial. And this is primarily um, at a CV max concentration barrier. Uh, the, the, the circulating concentration in the patient and the sensitivity that the patient saw was much lower uh, than in the animal model, which allowed that drug to actually move forward. So once they were able to show that and take it and put it back into a, a two-dimensional environment. Um, I'm, I'm sure it will be improved uh, with additional 3D uh, concepts, but the sensitivity was, was able to be attained uh, using a, a human-based um, iPS-derived cell. All right, I'd like to invite folks to follow up with any of the presenters with additional questions, and I'd like to thank them. Uh, if you wouldn't mind joining me, thanking them for their presentation. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.